Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really sorry about the delay, um, but there was a Security Council meeting, and uh, apparently that's what happens. You wait until everybody's out. Um, and the ambassador will be joining us in a few minutes. So we would like to start. I hope that um, we'll probably take another 15 minutes afterwards because we're starting late. So I hope you'll be able to stay. My name is Jean Judas, and I'm the director of Beit Izzy Shapiro, um, an NGO in Israel that provides innovative services and conducts advocacy and research for people with disabilities and disseminates knowledge in Israel and abroad. Beit Izzy Shapiro is really um, delighted to be able to chair the session today. And um, we will address the ways to harness the power of technology and entrepreneurship to expand the opportunities for people of all kinds of disabilities, physical, intellectual, sensory, learning, communication, or any kind of disability. So you know, I'd like to give you a roadmap um, of the very packed, but I hope interesting program ahead of us. First of all, we'll be um, have, hearing some words from our Israeli ambassador to the UN, Danny Danon. He will be joining us. We will then kickstart our discussion um, with the Canadian disability rights advocate, David Lepofsky, to my right here, who will in two short minutes tell us about the extraordinary potential that technology can have in transforming the entire experience of having a disability using his blindness to illustrate this. From that short, sharp illustration, we'll turn to Mr. Chapal Kaznabis, who is leading the WHO Global Initiative to make technology accessible to everyone everywhere. He will speak about the enormous importance of assist assistive technology. All this sounds great, but only if we can get governments and companies developing this cutting-edge technology to develop the technology and get it into the hands of people with disabilities. And that's what our final five speakers will address. I will share with you the efforts that Beit Izzy Shapiro is making to get entrepreneurs to take on the challenge to create new technology. After that, Ms. Leslie Shech, the Director of Science, Technology and Engineering in the Special Ed Public Schools in New York, will share her innovations in the education system. We will then hear from Ms. Shiri Azenkot, the Assistant Professor for the Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute on how to promote technology and accessibility within the academic settings. And from there, Gabi Admon Rick from the Israeli government's Disability Rights Commission will show us how the Israeli government has tried to use incentives and legislation to get needed accessible and adaptive technology into the hands of people with disabilities. Finally, our first speaker, Advocate David Lepofsky, will return to the microphone. Drawing on the grassroots cross-disability advocacy in which he has been involved for more than three decades in Canada for new laws to enable people with disabilities to fully participate in, in society, he will share how the law can be used most effectively to achieve the goal that our panel is here to discuss. We will not be reading long introductions of our panelists. You all have the bios in front of you. Um, so if anyone needs it in accessible form, just let us know. Well, the ambassador, ha oh, hello. <laughs> um, we haven't, the ambassador hasn't come yet, so we will wait for his um, greetings afterwards. Um, and um, I think we will start right now. And um, I invite David to open the proceedings. Good afternoon, and I want to thank the extraordinary Beth Izzy Shapiro, not only for their extraordinary work, serving the needs of people with disabilities of all populations within Israel, but also sharing their expertise with other countries around the world. I want to thank them for their work, and I, I want to thank them for honoring me with an opportunity to speak to you. 120, 130, 140 years ago, our, people's relationship with their entire world was judged by the amount of distance they could travel. And back then, you could only go as far in a day as you could walk on foot or maybe by horse and carriage, and in the case of the favored few, go by train. Now, our relationship with the distance around us has changed since we could get on an airplane and travel anywhere in the world, literally on a couple of hours notice, if we can get to the airport, get through the security and afford a ticket. In my lifetime as a blind person, a similar transformation has happened 
in the very experience of being blind. From 40 years ago when Braille had to be transcribed manually by volunteers who took a year to learn the skill, or printed words had to be read aloud by volunteers uh, and uh, recorded on audio tape, where the vast majority of printed information could only, was not available and we could only look to the little amount that was actually transcribed through one of those two media, to today, when you don't need Braille transcribers to create Braille, you need, simply need a Braille uh, display or Braille printer where the printed word can be read aloud if it's provided in an accessible electronic format uh, without needing any human being involved, where the distance between the printed word and Braille uh, or spoken output could be as little as a few seconds if you've got the technology. That kind of transformation has changed the entire experience uh, of being blind. Technology can be that much of an unprecedented game changer for the better, but at the same time, if it isn't designed right, it could as dramatically slam doors in our faces that previous we were open. If schools or employers adopt new technology that is not designed to accommodate our needs, we could find that educational or employment opportunities that we used to have access to have become unavailable to us because of technology. It is on that basis that we turn to the conversation we have this afternoon about what we do to make sure technology uh, works for good uh, and not for bad. the WHO and um, who is leading the global initiative to make technology accessible. Welcome. Thank you, Judith. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'll talk about how to attract more entrepreneurs in the field of assistive technology. And if you just ask one question to any entrepreneur, what attracts them in any sector, first thing they will say, we need the number. We need, we need to know the market. What are we talking about? What the impact it will create? So I tweaked the title of the, my presentation, and I'm saying this, assistive technology for all, rather than only for people with disabilities. And the reason be, because that large va variation in disability prevalence data all over the world, if you take the disability data, put it in a landscape, and you'll say the data exists from 1% to 22%. And low mid income countries, mostly data is below 5%. So they are not interested to invest much on a product which can make an impact only on 1% to 5% population. They need market. So they need to know the number, which is much higher than what is perceived only for people with disabilities. So this is what WHO now came with this data, that we need 1 billion assistive products today and 2 billion people by 2050. Keep it in mind, the world aging population will increase more than 2 billion by 2050 and most of this population will need assistive technology. So we have to look beyond traditional disability. We have to look at NCDs. We have to look aging so that we have a bigger market than what we thought we have before. And people living longer everywhere. It's not the issue of only high-income countries. Even the low mid income countries, people are living longer. And more age, more assistive products. It's not anymore only for people with disabilities. Every one of us, if we live long, we need assistive technology. And this is, but the problem is, we have a 10 years of CRPD, and we have only 10% access. Most of the people who need these services, they don't have access. And why? If we ask me one question, why, then I'll say it's because of the cost factor. 
unless and until these products become affordable, it will be difficult for any government, any insurance agency, or even, even for the individual to make out-of-pocket payment to buy this or to access this product. In this slide, these powered wheelchairs are more expensive than cars. So we need to now, time has come to ask, why, what is there in this powered wheelchair so it's more expensive than the cars? Or look at these, some screen readers are three to 10 times more expensive than the Microsoft Office. Why? Why a screen reader should be more expensive than the Microsoft Office? People can say number, but I said number is already there. We are not reaching to the number. And over the price of the cost of the product, it is overpriced service delivery system. The biggest problem, so its cost of any hearing aid ranges between $100 to $200. But when it reaches to the user, you have to pay three to $5,000. So unless and until we directly see and ensure this assistive products or hearing aids are available in the range around $200, whatever we do, whatever legislation we bring, it will not reach to the majority. The question is also, does everybody need an expensive $5,000 hearing aid? Especially the aging population who are gradually losing the hearing, do they need the, such a complicated, sophisticated hearing aid? And the answer is no. So the question is, could there be generic hear, hearing aids like we have a generic medicines now? You go to a, I go to Switzerland to buy a chem, any shop, chemist shop. First thing they ask, whether you want to buy a generic drug or a branded drug. So why can't we have a hearing aid of the same way, new generation, which will be much cheaper than the traditional ones? So if you see the current market beneficiaries, it's like top of this famous pyramid of Egypt, where is only the top 10% is beautiful granite label, and then this is the market, current market beneficiaries, high quality products for rich people or rich countries, and low quality products for poor or charity. So there is nothing in between. There is no middle class in the field of assistive technology. Either you have a higher class or a lower class. There is no middle class. And you'll not believe 30 years ago, the pharmaceutical industry or medicine industry was exactly like this. And the drugs were, we remember that HIV AIDS, one course was more than thousands of dollars, and today is not even a hundred dollars. So what made that change is this essential medicines list of WHO, which created a competition, which attracted new companies, which created generic medicines. So based on this learning, what we have done, we have created, identified the 50 top most priority assistive products. So every government, especially those governments who ratified the convention, now should ensure, like essential medicines, they should make these priority assistive products available at the country for their own people. But again, as I said, it will not happen if no, we don't get new business sector involved in this. And business, to attract the business sector, we have to say two billion new customers are waiting for you. So you come with your products, here are the two billion customers who need your products. And we have to also look for new technology and beyond business as usual. I gave an example. I believe a lot of technology which is used for disabled people actually benefits everybody. Anything you do for people with disabilities, everybody can benefit out of it. So as this technology. 
this lady, elderly lady, she using a GPS tracker to locate her house or a place to go. But my friends, they also use this GPS tracker to hide in their car, so if their car gets stolen, they know where it is. Or they know where their daughter is. So there are, though the technology, like a predictive texting, which designed for the people with disabilities, but everybody now is using it. There are a lot of switches which are designed for or labeled for people with disabilities. Everybody benefit. So we have to really look for those technologies and invest which benefits more people. And then only more companies will get inside it. Let's look at this. We had a big seminar last year in China. And we had a global conference on assistive devices and technology. We tried to put the issue in the agenda of the top leadership. So German Chancellor and Chinese Prime Minister, Premier, they were talking how to make this technology affordable. And Article 32, there's a component of international cooperation to make this technology available. So the Chinese Premier negotiating with the German Chancellor you transfer the technology, we'll make it affordable. And Chinese Premier was all the time was talking that we have 80 million people with disabilities in China and 2 million older people need assistive products in China. So it's not 80 million, 80 plus 200, 280 million. So the more we capture, the more it becomes an interesting proposition for the new industry or entrepreneurs to get in. So the key is partnership and international cooperation. We need to collaborate together. We need to ensure these products are available at an affordable cost. So we know which are the products to be invested. So WHO is looking for the next step, the partnership, to work with different agencies to ensure these products are available at an affordable cost. Let's do it together. Join the GATE movement. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. No? Thank you. So, thank you so much, Chapal. I've learned so much from you. Um, we're very happy to have um, the ambassador um, of um, Israel here, Dani Danon, as well as a deputy ambassador, David Roth. Welcome. Um, we'd like to, Mr. Am uh, His Excellency, Ambassador Dan Dernot, we'd like to really um, congratulate you on the incredible achievement of becoming the chair of the Sixth Committee. We feel very proud. And we're waiting for you to give your greetings. Thank you very much. Shalom, distinguished uh, UN delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here today. It is my pleasure to have you join us here today for this important event. Uh, experts that came uh, from all over the world to share their knowledge with us. I want to thank uh, the Argentinian Mission for co-sponsoring the event uh, with us today. Uh, Betty Di Shapira is uh, helping a lot to promote this important issue. And uh, all the advocates of this issue that came here today. Ladies and gentlemen, many people in this room are aware of the daily struggle that people with disabilities are facing a day in and day out. Some of you know it from a personal experience, some of you are experts in this field, and you know that the determination, the strength and the courage, that's what allows these people to continue and face the challenges. We have witnessed people with disabilities right to the top of every position, here in the UN, in different countries, and despite all obstacles today, those people are able to achieve wherever they want to go. Every individual has their own unique talents and their own mark that they want to live here on the world. So it is our responsibility, all of us, to ensure that each and every person can unleash their full potential. And that's why we are here today. I want to thank the people who came from Israel. We have a very respect the delegation from Israel, and uh, we have many diplomats in this room, representatives from the academia, civil society, and activists. 
Hopefully, today here, we start to break down the barriers for people with disabilities in order to enable them to live with dignity and full inclusion. And I believe that together we can make a difference. In Israel, in our beloved country, we are proud to be in the forefront of this effort. It is rooted in our heritage. It is rooted in our tradition. In Hebrew, we call it Tikkun Olam. Tikkun Olam is our mission to create a, a better place, a place which is more inclusive for everybody. Also, you all heard about the technology in Israel. We take a lot of pride of being the startup nation. In my former position, I was a minister in charge of science and technology, and we are proud of the technology that we are creating day in and day out. We are known for the innovation and the way we think out of the box. This creative spirit has led to a more open and accessible reality for all. Every single day, technology from the state of Israel is performing miracles for people with disabilities. Take, for example, the Israeli startup Sesame Enable. They have created a smartphone that is completely touch free. Now, people who don't have full use of their hands can reach out to their friends, call their family, call for help without the touch of even one button. Another Israeli invention, eye control, allows ALS and other locked in patients who can't speak to communicate with only by using their eyes. A special camera scans the patient's eye movements and blinks, and a small computer attached to audio speakers and a smartphone translates them into words and sentences. It is all made in Israel. This technology gives them a voice, it gives them the opportunity, it gives them their independence. Many people doubt that a truly inclusive society for all is even possible. But we in Israel, we are people who don't believe in the world's impossible or can't be done. We are people that find creative solutions to the problems that some people are already gave up on them. And we won't give up until all people of all abilities become full participants in Israel and around the world. I want to thank all of you for coming and sharing your knowledge here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Danone. Um, I'm now taking my cap off as a chair and presenting um, our work at Beit Izzy Shapiro. So, Sharon, how do I put it? Oh, it's on the screen there. Yeah, I can just paste this. Paste okay, this. good. Okay. So... For people without dis dis uh, disabilities, technology makes things easier. For people with disabilities, technology makes things possible. So why is technology so important? I think David already explained what independence that what a, a person can gain from technology. And with independence, there's quality of life and there's inclusion. And we know that there are many, article, there are many um, articles in the CRPD that relates to technology. Um, I've been coming to this conference for five years. Five years ago, I think there was one side event on technology. This year, I think there were six or seven maybe. So I think it's, it says it all. And as Chappelle said, um, really there are many features of technology that were originally made for people with disabilities. For example, the, the vibration on the smartphone. Who in this room today doesn't use that function? We all do. The touch screen, text to speech, closed captions, the audio box. You may be surprised, but all these features were originally developed for people with disabilities and to today are used by all. So companies are understanding that universal design is, what they, is the road to be going. So I'd like to start really with my teacher, who 
The, the children at Beit Izzy Shapira really are my teachers. And I'd like to tell you about Eitan, whom we started working with technology at a very early age, um, which is something which I think is really, really essential um, for, um, uh, for all. So Eitan today is an eight-year-old boy, and he's in our school, and he has a rare syndrome that prevents him from talking. Adults with his syndrome today in Israel are most in protected housing and considered to have severe intellectual disabilities. When Eitan was two and a half, we started working with him on communication assistive devices. And what did we discover? We discovered a very intelligent little boy with a great sense of humor. And he has lots to say for himself. And today he communicates with his siblings, families and friends through his iPad. The revolution of the iPad, and here we all have to say thank you to Steve Jobs, has really opened the world to so many of our clients. And so I'd like to just show you a very quick um, clip of Eitan. Um, you know, when the kids come back from the weekend into the classroom, they share together what happened to them. And Eitan's brother, whom he really loves, um, had a birthday party. So he, using his, his communication board and with the Apple TV, is telling the classroom, his friends and his teacher, what happened. What I want you to just have a look at is how adept he is at moving from feature to feature. He uses numbers, he uses pictures, he uses touch it. I wish I was as adept as he is in using the computer. So have a look at this. Um, how do I do it? <laughs> Sharon, sorry, this is not. No. no. I couldn't practice because. <laughs> okay. It's not, just it's hang on. on. It's not on the screen. Can we put it on? Um, it's supposed to be on the screen. That's very strange that it's not on the screen. Should I? In the meantime, I'll continue. I'll describe it. It's, um, I'm sorry you're going to miss it. Uh, you're missing out. Anyway, um, while you try, I'll just um, carry on. So really what's, what's actually happened is that um, the iPad has enabled us to include a ton in the regular school a few days a week. And he's really considered the cool kid on the block because he has this iPad that the other kids love using. They've learned how to communicate with him. And as his mom so rightly says, Eitan is so lucky to have been born in this decade. Okay, well, we'll move on. So as um, Ambassador Danon was saying, um, Israel is really, you know, one of its strengths is its high-tech community. So Beit Izzy Shapira really identified the tremendous opportunity how do we tap into the strength for people with disabilities in Israel? There's a very advanced ecosystem in Israel in the field of technology. There are government incentives. They're very vibrant entrepreneurs. They're excellent academic programs. And in fact, many global companies today are putting their research and development units in Israel. So we saw our great challenge as educating and creating awareness in our, tech, in our high tech community as to the importance of also developing um, technology for people with disabilities. So let me just say a word about Beit Izzy Shapira and how we work. We are an NGO and we're involved in social change and innovation. And we really um, have three core activities. We develop innovative and replicable models, which we leverage to, uh, which we research, and then we disseminate the knowledge through training and leverage cha tra change on a macro level through influencing policy and legislation. So we've worked in many different areas, in early intervention, in accessible environments, in different methods of treatment. But today I want to really um, focus on the issue of technology and to tell you that we had, so we had two major goals. The first goal is to increase um, the amount of technology being developed for people with disabilities in Israel. And secondly, to really give much thought to the implementation of technology, because each person is different and the application has to be accurate um, um, for each person. 
So what we did is um, we understood that to make a change in Israel, it would be important to develop an ecosystem that is an enabling environment to develop assistive technology. So we have built a network of interested partners from the government, from the tech leaders, entrepreneurs, people with disabilities, families and therapists and caregivers. And we believe that there can only be significant development through strong and committed partnerships. So I want to show you how we develop this ecosystem. And I'll start off with the developers and the entrepreneurs. So the first example is how we worked with app developers. Most of the apps on the market are not accessible for people with disabilities. So we wanted to promote the app developers' knowledge on how to build apps on principles of universal design and accessibility. So we approached Google with a proposition to train the app developers within their Google campus. We were really surprised at how keen so many of the top developers were to participate in the training. And of course, we worked with disability mentors and our professional staff. And it was really a huge success. And together, we developed guidelines. You can see here, we have a booklet that we made together on seven easy steps to make your app accessible. The app developers, in fact, gave us fantastic feedback that um, their knowledge has not only help people with disabilities, but it's also made their products better products for everybody. And by the way, we had app developers from Waze, Fiverr, GetTaxi, apps that are used universally today. The second example that I want to give is, um, uh, um, is the way we are encouraging entrepreneurship by creating an accelerator project together with a wonderful organization and another NGO called Present Tense. The accelerator, which is the first in the world in the field of disabilities to my knowledge, fosters technological ventures that have the potential to significantly improve the lives of quality and the quality of life of people with disabilities in Israel and around the world. The ventures that are accepted to our accelerator receive professional training, personal guidance from a mentor and business consultants and the opportunity to be part of the groundwork, groundbreaking entrepreneurial community in Israel. We've already finished two cycles of our accelerator project and five ventures have gotten funding or, and are in advanced stages of development. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, okay, so... Sharon there, sorry, okay, I've got it, I've got it, no, why is it going? Come on, Sharon, sit with me. Okay, so the next part of our ecosystem that we've been working with are the, um, uh, we go, the hackathons and the mackathons and the, the high-tech hubs that we go to in order to raise awareness and educate the high-tech community on the needs of people with disability and to inspire them to make products for people with disabilities. The next component of our ecosystem are investors. We know that there are not going to be serious products on the market without significant resources. And the donations of NGOs, of course, cannot meet this need. So we have made contact with a number of investor, investors and have tried to interest them and have successfully already a group of investors that have committed to invest in the field of disabilities. They see it as social impact and as well as getting um, um, a return on their money. Maybe not the same amount as for other areas, but certainly it's a win-win. The next... Um, a, a, a component of our ecosystem is the better site and the research. I think that we've learned so much at Beit Easy Shapira about how there can be great technological devices and they don't really meet the needs of people with disabilities. So we see ourselves as a better site and we do quite a lot of research. There's not enough research being done today. But one of the projects which I just want to give you an example, which the ambassador spoke about, is Sesame and Abel. Sesame and Abel went through our accelerator project, and um, we got a grant, a very significant grant from Google Worldwide, to disseminate this device to all people who need it in Israel for nothing, and then to research 
the, 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 the friendliness and the usability of the device. And what we learned is that, um, you know, it's so important to check with the consumers and to see whom it's working for and whom it isn't and where the bugs are. So we could give this feedback to the developers and they could improve their product. And today, well, it's certainly a product that's ready to go to market around the world. So I think a better site is really very, very important. The next component um, of the ecosystem is training. You know, you can have a lot of technology, but professionals and people with disabilities and families don't know how to use it. So we've, you know, we have an institute at Beit Izzy Shapiro where we do training on technology. And um, there's a great thirst for learning um, from all the different stakeholders about this. And lastly, the last part of the ecosystem is government. I won't speak about it because <laughs> Gabi will be speaking about that. But there's no question that the government has to be deeply involved um, in, in, in the ecosystem. So, um, in order to scale up, there's no doubt that you need global collaborations. And we are working with Google, we are working with Apple, we're working with SAP, and we're also on a task force of the European Union where we're working on technology and play which is a very interesting um, um, forum. But really our vision is to build an ecosystem that can be replicated and scaled up worldwide. We hope all countries will develop their own ecosystems and there can be joint collaborations between countries to ensure technology is affordable and can be shared effectively across borders. And we would love to learn from other people here today if they um, have things that we could collaborate on. So I'd just like to end off with um, the, 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 the film, hopefully, will work, um, of the, the hand-free um, um, cell phone that um, Google and Beit Izzy Shapiro um, um, have disseminated in Israel and researched. So let's see if it works. Your telephone monthly, what's more? שבן אדם רגיל לוקח כמובן מאליו. ברגע שנהייתי מוגבל לגמרי, שלא יכולתי לתקשר עם אף אחד, רק אם מישהו עומד לידי או עונה לי לפלאפון, ברגע שיש את זה, פשוט אני חופשי לחלוטין. לך תעוד על זה, לוקח לי חמש דקות. קודם כל, מדובר בעצמאות, שזה דבר חשוב מאוד. למרות שאני... מוגבל, אני מנהל עסק בטלפון וכלי שעוזר לי בזה, וגם התמונות והאימיילים. הזמנתי בית חכם, אני שולט בטלוויזיה, תאורה. אתה רוצה לדבר עם רז, רז זה אחותה התאומה? כשהיא בדרך הביתה ורז בבית. הוא המזח. הוא איתי, נכון, עדיף איתי. אני יכול לעשות הכל לבד. וזה מרגיש פנטסטי. You know, I, I invite um, everybody to look at our blog. Sorry. I look at everybody to look at our blog and to be in contact. I'm now taking off the hat of the presenter. I'm very excited to invite you, Leslie, to speak about your work. I'd love to. He has just switched out the computers. Okay. Could we have the technical assistance, please? One second. Do you want to come here? Oh, there you are. <laughs> now I did too. <laughs> All right, I'll just start. Yeah, just if you can. Um, my name is Leslie Sheck. I'm the director of STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math for District 75 for the New York City Department of Education. The New York City Department of Education is comprised of approximately 1.1 million students. About 250,000 of those students have IEPs or individual educational plans. However, 24,000 of those 250,000 have severe learning disabilities. Our students are on the autism spectrum, 
have significant cognitive delays, are severely emotionally challenged, sensory impaired, and are multiply disabled. District 75 is the largest special ed district in the country. We have 60 schools collated in over 350 sites throughout the five boroughs. That's weird. It, the connector isn't right. There you go. Thank you. Um, there isn't one path to get to go where you have to. Just as we teach our staff about alternate methods for students to learn, we approach each student individually with the expectations that they can learn and they can succeed. So although there may not be a direct or even a single path to get to where you have to go, the important thing is that they get there. When the iPad was introduced six years ago, it became a game changer for our students, especially those with speech and communication issues. Once they had to use a large and heavy output device, such as a Dynavox, that looked like a lunchbox and cost about $7,500. Now they could have be socially accepted and be one of the cool kids with an iPad, which cost about $400. Apps such as Proloco to go LAMP, Verbally, all give our students the ability to have a voice. I'd like to share some stories with you. The first is going to be about a young lady, Danica, who has cerebral palsy and is an avid reader. We would always chat about the books she was reading, which were difficult for her to hold. Another is about a program entitled The Mouse Squad. Students are trained to repair computer hardware in their schools and this many times leads to careers in IT. Another story is about a classically trained music teacher who really needed some changes. When he asked for iPads to create an iPad band, I jumped up the chance to provide them. Students on the spectrum who we didn't know were musically inclined rose to the occasion. Another story takes us through a virtual world to practice real world skills through going into the real world. Students with autism practice living in a community, shopping, and doing everyday activities. And our final story takes you to the American Museum of Natural History, where our students presented their work at our second annual STEM fair. Through science, technology, engineering, and math, our students created devices to operate in the commonplace. It might be better if we can dim the lights a little. Oh, that's it. That was good. Oh, yeah, go back. It was playing. Oh, yes, it is. It's coming in. The voiceover's first. is really awesome. When did you get this iPad? Just yesterday. <laughs> Mouse is an organization that enables students to have technical skills to help run a school-based help desk. Within the Mouse Squad, we do maintenance as well as repairs. Students are using technology to fix technology. And what's nice is that it is mobile technology. about this program is so amazing. Uh, we're doing 
a whole bunch of stuff on, on Second Life, including <laughs> learning how to, you know, how to buy things, learning how to get a job, application, and, um, you know, and it's just really amazing. We set up this program as a place for students to work on their social communication and independent living skills, specifically for students who are preparing to transition into the real world after school. So we have classes that go on trips on the bus, on public transportation, classes that go to a local restaurant and practice ordering from the menu and leaving a tip and how much tip should they leave. Um, and classes that go to the bank and, and to businesses in the community and ask for job applications. Where are you? Um, I'm at Pat Lynn. Oh, yeah. What are you doing there? I'm just waiting to get an application to, so I can work in a pet store. Hey Taylor, yeah. you're, you're, are you headed to the grocery yeah. store? Yeah, I'm trying to find where to go. Too far, huh? You going there? Yeah, me, Chanel, and I. Let's, let's stay together because we don't want to end up getting lost. Now that we're together, we gotta find out where the grocery store is. So tell me your name and go ahead. Grace. And Grace, what's uh, your favorite thing about the 3D world? In 3D world, I don't have to be—I I don't have to be myself. I could be different in 3D world, and I could also hang out with people from different schools. Because in 3D world, it's more fun than sometimes in the real world. But that's the difference between 3D world and the real world. The virtual world gives these students the chance to experience themselves in a new way without the lens of their disability as the first thing that people see and experience about them when they meet them. Um, some people might say that it's dangerous to, to blur the line of, of what's real and, and what's fantasy in this virtual world, but I think that it actually allows the students a safe place to experiment with aspects of their identity that they've always experienced as fixed. For example, using a wheelchair. Did your avatar use a wheelchair? Yeah, but I, I decided to get rid of my wheelchair because I wanted to like walk in 3D world. And did you do it? Yeah. Uh, this is called Lock It Up. And it's basically no texting and driving. So first of all, put their phone in there, and it will lock. And then the, the driver will have the, 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 the opener on his uh, keychain. But he has to like swipe it closely to open it. And for him to do that, he has to take the keys out of the ignition to do that. Uh, we use little bikes. It's like uh, circuitry. And um, we use like patent for the uh, like for the phone to be inside so it won't get damaged. Um, this is the uh, RFID meter that if if the car don't have Bluetooth, they can swipe it using the uh, the tag to get their phone. And what do you want to do? Uh, a building design. Cornell Tech, that's the new Cornell University campus here in New York City. And um, I want to present the academic perspective. My background is in computer science, and right now I conduct research on accessibility, and that's the field that researches assistive technology. Um, so as, uh, 
As an academic uh, in a research university, I have several roles. And the main role that I have, and the main role that I have is as a researcher. And I work with PhD students who I also help train as independent researchers. And then a much more minor role that I have is as a teacher. So I only teach about one course a semester for undergrads and master's students. And that's pretty typical. So the thing I really want to talk about is research in accessibility and how we can leverage research that's being done in academia in entrepreneurship. So in general, we ask two types of questions in our research. The first type of question that we ask is what kinds of challenges do people with disabilities face? So we do studies to really try and understand the user populations. For example, in my research, one of the recent projects that we have, that we've done, asks the question, how do people with low vision wayfind? What challenges do they experience? Then the other type of question that we ask in our research has to do with designing new technologies or innovation. So, one of the follow-up questions that we asked about our low vision users was how can we design a new accessible maps applications for mobile devices that uses both speech and large print that's much more accessible than say Google Maps. And we do this research typically in groups. So I'm a faculty member and I have uh, several PhD students that I work with, uh, several master's students and also undergrads. And the students are all very overcommitted, so they work on their research, but they also take classes. Um, they, typically, they typically have several projects that they're working on, and of course, they're still learning. So we all work together on our research, and the outputs that we produce are, of course, papers, because we're in academia, and the incentive is uh, for us to publish, and we present our findings from our research in academic conferences and journals. And then occasionally, we also take the prototypes that we develop and we release them on the internet. Sometimes we open source them, other times we take videos of proof of concepts and we put them online. Uh, so we do try to disseminate the information that we find and the designs that we create but this is very, very far from creating viable products that people with disabilities can use on a daily basis. So that leads me to talk a little bit about the opportunities and challenges of where academia and research fits into the bigger picture of entrepreneurship. So there are several things that we as researchers do really well. Uh, so we're good at user research. Uh, we're good at developing early stage prototypes. The students can afford to take risks because even if they decide to design a technology that doesn't end up being effective, it can still be a valuable learning experience for them. So this is something that if you use up resources from investors, you might not necessarily be able to do. Another thing that we can do is think far off into the future. So for example, one of our projects right now is looking at augmented reality and how we can use augmented reality for people with low vision. So this is probably something that's not feasible in the short term, but within the next five to 10 years, might be a viable business opportunity. But as academics, we have the luxury of exploring these ideas early on. Um, on the downside, we as academics are not very good or incentivized to work on fixing bugs or maintaining the prototypes that we build. Uh, we're also not incentivized to add incremental features that might be very, very important in creating a product, but don't necessarily have any research value to them. We also have challenges reaching out to a large base of users. So we do some small scale studies like the one I talked about with low vision users, but these are typically done with at most 20 people. So reaching out and uh, disseminating our findings, our prototypes to, or even our products to a large set of end users is something that we don't have the resources to do. And similarly, we also don't have the resources to train people on how to use the technology that we design. 
And finally, we also don't necessarily invest in monetization. So this is both good and bad because on one hand, we don't have to be burdened by thinking about a viable business plan. So we can focus on uh, technology for very small populations. But on the other hand, this doesn't necessarily lend itself to, again, creating a viable business. So I think that the key to really advancing the field of assistive technology and accessibility is to be able to learn and understand what academia, what research has to offer, what it is that we do very well, and to partner with other organizations that can fill in the gaps and help us take the prototypes that we develop, the innovations, and connect with uh, the target users. So to take the prototypes, to flesh them out into products, to connect with target users, to train the users, and to continue to maintain the products so that they can be used by the end users over a long period of time. So I'm happy to have a chance to talk about this here, and I hope to find ways uh, to speak more with people after this panel to brainstorm some ideas for how we can do this and partner together. to talk about um, government's role in technology. Thank you, Jean, and thank you for inviting me here to speak, and thank you for organizing this fascinating side event. The issue of developing technologies which open doors for persons with disabilities, like we saw today, all the examples, is such an important one, and Beth Easy is one of the leaders in promoting this field in Israel, inspiring others to follow in their path. Uh, I'm the last speaker, so I'll try to be short. I want to give some examples, I'm almost the last, right? So there's somebody after me, right? So, I want to give some examples of what the government can do to enhance the development of technologies for persons with disabilities and to provide the assistive devices to make the people use them. And I'll end with a little bit, another question that I'd like you to think about. So I think the first thing that we need to think about when we make the, when we're talking about ecosystems for innovation uh, on the side of the government is awareness raising through education. And we heard a little bit about it. And I think in Israel, many design schools have taken up this project. Um, a few months ago, I participated in a very unique event. It was in uh, Bezalel, the Academy of Arts and Designs in the Hebrew University. And they were showing projects of a design project called What is Time? The, project was, the idea of the project was to create a product that would assist a person with intellectual disabilities to cope more independently with their daily schedule do things that they like leave the apartment on time, reach work on time, remember that they have an appointment, a doctor's appointment, and to do these things independently. So each group of students was assigned with a person with disabilities, and they heard about their challenges in their lives and designed a product to suit these specific needs. Um, for most of these students, I believe it was the first interaction with the issue of disability. They probably grew up thinking, like most people in society, the disability is something that happens to the other people, to some medical problem that the unfortunate encounter. I don't think they had met a person with intellectual disabilities, let alone thought that they could live a full life, provide, and provided the right supports. Uh -huh. So this was the, their first meeting with people with, dis with intellectual disabilities, and the idea was to create something that will help these people in their daily life to understand the concept of time. So it's, a, it's also very interesting to think about how we make time accessible. But that, I'm just giving this as an example because we're educating the future developers, the, the people that will design our future products. And we want them to think about disability as an interaction between person and environment. And we want the future in a developers, it doesn't matter what field they will be doing, to take into account disability when they're thinking about their products not only in projects that are specifically focused on disability and um, accessibility. Um, so that's the one aspect uh, that, which is important. And the second um, is to, of course, make these um, ideas into marketable products available for others. So in Israel, there are several funds for providing new technologies. They talked about, we've heard about the role of the government and funds. So we have two different funds. The Israel National Insurance has a fund for developing service for the disabled. 
which has been supporting for many years now technology for persons with disabilities. They have provided accessibility adjustments and personal adapted, personally adapted equipment. And lately they launched together with the Ministry of Science, Technology and Space, a project to fund the development of technologies. Projects uh, are checked for both technological and production viability for marketing feasibility and for contribution to rehabilitation. There are several funding programs available and support grants range from 50% to more. Each request is limited to a grant around uh, 150,000 uh, US dollars and for a maximum period of two years. In addition, the Ministry of Science, Technology and Space has published a call to submit offers and proposals for the development of scientific and technological infrastructures in the field of innovation for elderly populations. And we heard that this is a related topic. So naturally, some of these um, proposals will be also relevant for people with disabilities. The third aspect of support, um, as Japal mentioned, is applying these technologies to as many people as possible. So in Israel, people with disabilities can, like many countries in the world, can usually enjoy government funding for a wide variety of assistive technologies from the obvious canes for thesis, motorized wheelchairs, home equipment, hearing aids, to more sophisticated things like cochlea implants and different uh, visual um, assistants, uh, CCTVs, braille, braille displays. And lately, as we saw, the iPads are so important, it also has entered into our um, um, medical um, basket. So, um, of course, uh, these things, there's bureaucracy to get them, and not every, everything, everything every person dreams about is covered. But when we meet, when we see the influence of these things on the children, on the people, and what doors it opens to them, it's, um, it's very important. So the, the fourth way to make uh, technologies available is through the accessibility requirements. The Israeli Equal Rights Law has a very detailed requirements about accessibility, and we have many regulations, and they deal with the public buildings, the new and, and existing public buildings, the public spaces such as parks, uh, nature sites, beaches, and also services. And our regulations are enforceable, and the commission that I work for has supervisors that go around the country and check if they are implemented. So when we talk about services, the regulations define that technology such as hearing assistive devices, FM systems, etc., captioning, and accessible visual displays are to be provided. Our regulations also define that internet sites providing services have to meet the international accessibility requirements. The accessibility regulations have also influenced other things that aren't in the regulations, such as the system that's called Step Here that gives um, audio information about location. Many people that have been doing the accessibility, they put this in as well because they think it's really useful. So as David was saying, today's life is different for people with disabilities. Much more is available and the possibilities are endless. But I want to end with another question for all of us to think about when we talk about the CRPD and technology. This hasn't come up today, but as the administrator of the, administrator of the uh, Facebook page, I often receive all kinds of videos of these amazing technologies. These all kinds of contraptions that make people walk, talk, see, jump, or climb up hills. Um, these videos are always amazing and breathtaking, but they, they make me feel uncomfortable. And I'll tell you why. Because when we're looking at these amazing technologies, they also imply and reinforce the image of disability that I really would like us not to have. This is the image of a disabled people that disabled people have had to live with for a long time. The image of their body as broken, abnormal, passive, and waiting to be repaired by experts, doctors, innovators, who have come to has come as saviors to relieve them for, from their unfortunate condition. Making the sitting person stand and walk, the deaf person talk, correct behavior, and amend social interaction. This image does not accept disability as a part of human diversity and as identity. So we are in the CRPD conference, and it's important to remember that the CRPD puts in place a different definition of disability, seeing it as human variety, and most importantly, as an interaction between a person and his or her environment between a person with impairments and the barriers imposed by society, hindering full participation on, equal, on an equal basis. 
So whenever I receive a video or hear about innovative technology, I ask myself, was the sender or design aware of this distinction? Were they trying to fix and transform disability or were they trying to remove barriers and ease interaction and allow full participation? Like the examples that we saw here today, like the amazing examples of the way that the, the iPads are used. So are they aware of this? This is a very subtle, but very important in my opinion distinction when we are developing technologies. I think that only when we understand this distinction and we develop technologies like the ones we are talking about today, we will make a world that is accommodates everyone equally. Thank you. Changing uh, in but. I'd now like to turn to advocate uh, David Lepofsky, who will sum up um, the session and talk about technology from his point of view. Of the various uh, areas where we need to battle from access for accessibility, from my perspective as a community organizer and uh, accessibility advocate in Canada, the area of technology should be the sector where we can make the most progress the most quickly. That is so for two reasons. The first is that the technology that we will be using in our workplaces, our schools, our governments, and our homes five years from now hasn't been purchased yet. It hasn't been ordered yet. It hasn't even been designed yet. So it is possible for us to collectively ensure that when it is designed and before it is put on the market, we can all use it. Making that easier, technology is the very sector of our economy which is the wellspring of innovation. It is constantly reinventing itself. So coming up with stuff that we can use ought to be the easiest. And yet all the speakers today, while outlining absolutely essential measures to help get us there, working with entrepreneurs, academic research, government funding, creative innovations in school boards and other public agencies. They're essential, but they're not enough. We won't get there unless every jurisdiction passes strong, effective, and enforceable and enforced accessibility legislation. Let me offer you just a few ingredients of what that legislation needs to include. I've written a discussion paper on this, which I'm happy to share. Send a request to me at aodafeedback at gmail.com or tweet me at David Lepofsky and I'll send it to you. As well, Sharon is gonna pass around a list if you wanna sign up, put your email down to get updates on our efforts in Canada. In a sense, the core ideas behind legislation I propose are these. Learn from us in Canada what we do well and what we don't do so well. As a Canadian, I'm proud that we're very good at defining disability rights. As a Canadian, I'm not as proud as I'd like to be at the fact that the Americans are much better than we at implementing disability rights. Our government of Ontario proudly passed our first accessibility law in 2005 and got a good start on implementing it. That deserves a close look but they've fallen far off the rails on implementing it in the past five years. That needs a kickstart. Our Canadian government is to be credited with promising a new National Disability Act, and if strong and if wedded with a, a, a ratification of the optional uh, protocol for the CRPD, it could make a huge difference for the majority of Canadian provinces that still need to get on the accessibility law uh, action wagon. But what do you need to put in that law? First, it needs to get rid of the idea that we're a minority. We aren't. We're the minority of everyone. Everybody has a disability or will get one, and therefore the law isn't about what others without disabilities could give us. It's about what we can make sure that everyone can benefit from so they, those who haven't gotten their disabilities yet don't face what we have in the past. Second, the law needs to have a clear and strong goal. Credit to Ontario for setting full accessibility, not improved accessibility, that's far too weak, but full accessibility as the goal, and for setting a deadline. 
in 2005, they said it is 2025. Unfortunately, we're nowhere near on schedule for getting there. But setting a clear, strong goal, not a compromised one, and an achievable deadline are essential. The next feature any effective law in this area must have is it must impose detailed requirements, not just vague general statements of non-discrimination or equality. Uh, businesses, public sector organizations need to know what they have to do exactly and when they have to do it by. Governments in drafting this legislation have to get over the myth that people with disabilities want to regulate everyone and obligated organizations don't want to be regulated at all. We actually have a shared interest in having clear directions on what everybody needs to do and when they need to do it by. Next, it is absolutely essential to focus, especially in the information technology area, not just on removing old barriers, but fundamentally on preventing the creation of new barriers. Every jurisdiction must make it a matter of law and public policy, for example, that not one penny of public money or whatever currency you use will ever be used again to create any new barriers against people with disabilities. That's a proposition that no one can dispute. Next, we need to use the public purchasing power to induce entrepreneurship, a combination of governments requiring accessibility and technology and only spending money on accessible technology will increase the drive in the private sector for entrepreneurship in this area. Of course, at a conference like this, we would all agree that there also has to be effective enforcement, but just that cliche is not enough. It is important to drill into what effective enforcement must include. To begin, it must not operate on the proposition that we must first educate for years and then start enforcing. I know of no more effective educator than an effectively enforced law. You want people to come to a seminar or workshop to learn about how to do accessibility make it the law to do accessibility and make it clear that enforcement is going to start, they'll come and they'll learn. And they'll learn very well. That's not to say that enforcement has to be brutal or draconian or excessive, but it's got to be clear, it's got to be expected, and it's got to be uh, manifest in public. It's important to mainstream enforcement. Don't just have accessibility enforcers. Rather, find every lever of government power that can be borrowed or utilized. Health inspectors, give them an accessibility mandate. Environmental inspectors, add accessibility to their list. Let obligated organizations know that whatever public sector enforce inspection official might happen to come onto their property for whatever issue, whether it's tainted meat in your restaurant or an elevator that might not be safe for the public, they've got an accessibility checklist too. Just that fact can dramatically increase enforcement. Uh, and effective compliance. And finally, include in an enforcement regime opportunities for crowdsourced participation in enforcement. Now, I don't expect, suggest that we leave it to individuals with disabilities to have to litigate accessibility barriers one at a time. That's a burden. While they've got to have that opportunity, it's a burden that's quite substantial, and we can't leave it to that alone as a means for effective enforcement. However, if we do require obligated organizations to, for example, have accessibility, information technology accessibility plans to make them public and to make them accountable, then members of the public could go to websites if they're required to post them there, see what companies and public sector organizations are proposing to do, and can help initiate the enforcement process if needed if it's clear that they fall short. Even the expectation of that possibility will help induce greatest compliance. Finally, whether we call it enforcement, whether we could call it compliance, whatever it may be, we've got to be creative in finding the levers of public power to help get organizations moving. One illustration I will conclude with comes from Toronto and just this past Monday night. I have the privilege of chairing the Special Education Advisory Committee that advises Canada's largest school board, the Toronto District School Board. We have delivered a series of recommendations for reform just this past Monday that included a proposal 
a recommendation for reforms in the area of digital accessibility. Now, when they created these advisory committees under Ontario law 15 years ago, nobody was even thinking about digital accessibility. But using every avenue that we can to bring these to the public fore, we can make a huge difference. We can make it so that through the various measures I've talked about and those of my fellow panelists, in five or six years, workplaces, schools, and others can make sure that the technology they deploy is fully accessible, not as is the case at present. Thank you very much. do what we what happened to us to others so i just want to thank you all for coming and especially to our wonderful speakers and i hope it was interesting for all thank you